Happy Sunday, Cross Park. Amanda and Judah and I miss being with y'all very much, but I'm grateful that we can continue to worship, albeit separately as families, but worship together in the Lord. Before we begin our worship service this morning, we have a few announcements for you. All of these are found in the weekly email, and if you have any questions about them, you can feel free to reach out to me or someone else on staff. But the first and maybe the most important announcement is that today at 11.45 a.m., we have an all-church Zoom call. So this is going to be a great opportunity for us to meet together virtually, to see everyone's faces, to say hello. And then Jeff is going to break people out into different small groups so that you can connect with one another and pray. But we ask two things of you in preparation for this. First, we ask that you would join the Zoom call as a family and not on all your separate devices since there's a limited number of people that can be uh, or a limited number of devices that can be on the Zoom call at a time. Second, when you join the Zoom call, please have your microphone muted so that it's not completely crazy right at the beginning. You'll have an opportunity to wave and say hello to everyone on the call before you're put into your different breakouts. But um, I'm really excited for this and look forward to seeing many of your faces there. Second, we've announced for a little while now that Cross Park has purchased a license to uh, take advantage of a Paul Tripp marriage and parenting conference. So you can find those links in the weekly email. Uh, this is a great opportunity. This is a hard time uh, for our families and this is a great resource for, for us to be equipped to love one another well as we're all quarantined together at home at least for a little while longer. Women have been meeting together at Cross Park Church for prayer for a really long time and, and over this season uh, women have been meeting weekly on Saturdays through Zoom. So if you are interested in joining those women or in sharing prayer requests with them, you can, you can check out our Facebook page for more info or reach out to Wendy Shank and she'd be glad to get you connected. Women at Cross Park have also been having a Wednesday evening book study studying the book Forever by Paul Tripp. Uh, Trish is leading this. There have been lots of women involved, and this is a great opportunity for you if you want to connect with women over Zoom and study this book together about our eternal hope, our, our rest, and our joy that Jesus is going to secure for us one day. Youth group is meeting tonight over Zoom at 7.30 p.m. Youth be looking out for a Zoom link that will go out today. Look forward to seeing your faces there and connecting as we consider God's word together. And two last announcements. Uh, you, we've been hearing for a little while about some of the food distribution that Cross Park Church has been a part of. Tyler Miller has been heading this up and has been doing a really great job uh, coordinating and connecting people to this important ministry in our city. Uh, there's always needs going forward, and we would ask that you would consider participating in this in one way or another. If you have questions about how you might be able to serve and, and minister to the least of these, as Jesus has called us to do, you can contact Tyler Miller, and his information is also in the weekly email. And finally, uh, we've gotten great feedback from the Life from Lockdown series that Jeff and Jordan have been doing together live on YouTube, and there's going to be part four on the Cross Park YouTube page this Thursday at 7 p.m., so look forward to that time. Good morning, Cross Park. Today we continue our sermon series on Romans chapter 8, which many Christians have called their favorite chapter in the Bible. I know that's true for some of you as it is for me. And the passage that we'll focus on today has to do with the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's interesting. In Jesus' very first public sermon captured in Luke chapter 4, he teaches and preaches from an Old Testament passage focused on the Spirit. It's Isaiah 61, and I want to call us to worship from that passage now. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. We 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you who are a holy God, a consuming fire, invite us now into your presence and we know that we don't stand before you in worship as those who stand on our own deeds, our own righteousness. If we were to stand before you with our thoughts, words, and deeds as our record, we could not stand. We thank you that because of the work of Jesus, he has paid the price of our sin and he has imputed to us the perfect righteous robes that he has earned so that we are covered in his purity, we are forgiven and we are washed clean. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have done the work to apply that work of salvation to us. And we pray that you would continue the work which you've begun in us even now, that you would make our singing, our praying, even my preaching glorious in your sight and you would use it as a means of grace to change us more and more into the image of Christ. We pray that you would be at work in our worship and present with us even now. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thou 
now my wisdom and now my true word I ever with thee and now with me Lord thou my great father and I thy true son thou in me dwelling and I with thee I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only the first in my heart. I, King of heaven, my treasure thou art. Let's confess our faith together now using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's respond now singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. This is where we go to the Lord in prayer. So please bow your heads and join me as we pray. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. Lord God, this morning we can recount the many ways that you have been faithful to us. Lord, you have pursued us even when we turn our back on you. And so this morning, Lord, as we worship you, we pray that you would give us a reverent heart. Lord, as we sing, as we pray, as we hear your word preached, God, that we would respond to you in a way that is honoring and glorifying to you. God, you tell us, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And we confess that this week we have not done that. Lord God, we don't understand the depth of our sin. We don't understand the many ways that we have sinned against you. But Lord, we pray that you would give us a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Give us more awareness of our sin, that we would repent and turn away from it and turn to you. Lord God, we thank you that your mercy and kindness is always near. You tell us that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just, that you forgive us 
and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So God, help us be encouraged that your forgiveness of us is full and complete. Lord, that that would be motivation for us to seek you first and to give you the best of our day, the best of our time and attention. Lord God, we want to pray that you would bring spiritual revival to our country, that in the midst of these dark times, that you would draw people to yourself. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen the church. We pray that the gospel would be proclaimed boldly. God, we pray for our leaders as they make decisions on when to open up our cities, our states, our country. Lord, with so many people divided on this issue, we pray for unity. We pray for your wisdom for our leaders. God, we want to give you thanks along with Matt and Becky Brunson for the birth of another Cross Park baby for little Joanna Rose Brunson. And God, we pray that you would give her uh, your love and your kindness in such a way that she would respond to it by giving you her life and her heart at an early age, and that all her days that she would walk with you and serve you. Lord, we pray for Matt and Becky that you would give them uh, energy in the days ahead. Lord God, we want to thank you for the opportunity to do food distribution, to partner with Star Mount Church as we bring meals uh, to many people in apartments across Charlotte. God, we pray that you would use this opportunity to remind people tangibly of your love for them, your faithfulness to them, and Lord, that you would use this to, as an opportunity to engage them in a way that they would respond to you. Lord God, we pray for cross Park small groups, discipleship groups, and Bible studies. Even though we're physically apart, we pray that you would use this virtual platform that we're using these days to draw people closer to each other, that you would strengthen relationships, not only relationships with each other, but our relationship with you as well. Lord God, as we continue to sing to you, we pray that our worship will be pleasing and honoring to you. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for our salvation and the hope that you give us in Christ. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, amen, Cross Park Church, and may the peace of Christ be with you.
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Our sermon passage today comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 13, and I want to begin by reading it to you. I want you to listen carefully because this is God's Word. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the promise of life. We need life by your Spirit. We thank you that you speak to us. You're still speaking. We know that faith comes by hearing. So we need to listen and hearing by the word of Christ. And so we need to pay close attention to this, your word. We pray that you would apply it to us. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you make Jesus especially present to us today? We pray that Jesus, you would speak to us through your word. That Holy Spirit, you would apply it to us to change us. To not leave us the way that you found us today. And we know that for any of that to happen, we need you to work. So Holy Spirit, we pray that you would. And we pray it all earnestly in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine for a moment a hypothetical story that through a series of unbelievable occurrences, you come into possession of both the cure for and the vaccine for COVID-19. Perhaps it's like a movie. There's an eccentric scientist who pulls up next to you in a parking lot. He is on the run by some greedy company that wants to take this cure and this vaccine from him for unjust gain. And this this mad scientist, this eccentric scientist tells you his whole story and you believe him. And he entrusts you with these things and he puts them in a duffel bag and gives them to you and tells you that you need to do something with them. As you get in the car, you look in your rear view mirror, you look around, you probably take the duffel bag and buckle it in next to you for safekeeping. You instantly realize two things. Number one is that you now possess something of invaluable worth. It is this invaluable antidote that the world needs. And number two, that you must use it. Of course, you wouldn't come home and put it into the attic or stuff it into the closet and then forget about it. No, you would recognize that you have the very thing that our world needs right now and you would do something with it. You would have an invaluable resource and you would know that you would need to use it. Now, Romans chapter 8 is written in such a way to convince us of a similar truth, that we have something of invaluable, inestimable worth, that we belong to Christ and that we have Christ and that in Him we have the Spirit. And if we have the Spirit, then we must use Him. We must make use of this invaluable antidote that deals with really our greatest problems, sin and death. And Paul is writing in such a way to convince the Christian of those very things, to help us understand who who we are in Christ and what we have. I want us to ask three different questions today. The questions really have to do with 
the question of belonging, a question of confidence, and a question of life. So let's look at those three. And the first question is this, do you belong? Notice verse 9, how Paul begins this section. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Here's the context. For the first eight verses, Paul has drawn this very sharp distinction between two ways to live. You can live in the flesh, or you can live in the Spirit. To live in the flesh means that you just simply live as you would normally do, according to your human nature. To live in the natural sense, in the flesh. And we know the Bible's testimony is that we're born with a sin nature. So that means that we live in contrary to God's design. We don't live pursuing God. And so to live in the flesh means, Paul tells us, that we are dying. We already have uh, a sort of spiritual death where we're separated from God. We are spiritually dead and eternally so. But Paul's saying that even now we cannot please God. And in fact, we're at hostility with God if we're in the flesh. Now that's one way to live. And Paul's describing how horrible that way of life is. You don't want to live that way. But there's an alternative. There's a way to live in the Spirit. And what it means to be in the Spirit, Paul has explained, is that we have come to know Jesus. We have come into Christ so that We know there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you have the Spirit, you have Christ, and you are forgiven, you're washed, you're made righteous. Now Paul draws the distinction between those two ways to live. And he turns now to these Roman Christians who this letter was first addressed to, and he wants to encourage them. And he says, you, however, are not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit. Let me remind you that the things that I just said, those horrible descriptions of those, uh, that, that circumstance where you are separated from God at hostility with Him are not true of you. You're in the Spirit. That means you have life and peace. You have the very things that matter most. He wants to encourage them, and so he's reminding them of who they are in Christ. There's absolute certainty that if you're in Christ, you're forgiven. There's no condemnation. But... He adds a qualifier. Did you hear it? If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. So Paul starts really with an implicit question here. Do you belong? Do you belong to Christ? If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. If you're in Christ, you have the Spirit. But the only way you have the Spirit, the only one, the way, way that you have this life that it brings peace and real lasting life both now and for eternity is if you have the Spirit and the only way to have the Spirit is if you're in Christ. So the most important question that we begin with and that you could ever ask in your life is that, am I in Christ? Now how do you know if you're in Christ? Well the Spirit is at work within you and He's done two things. He has given you a sorrow over your sin. So much so that you want to turn away from it. That doesn't mean you've all of a sudden become perfect, but you recognize your sin is a problem. You recognize it's there, and you want to turn away from it for the first time. And again and again and again as you see it. It's what the Bible calls repentance. And the second thing is that there is a faith in Christ. There is a trust in Jesus as your Savior, as the only one who can save you from your sin. I love the way that 1 Peter 1.8 puts it. How do you know that you have faith in Christ? He says this, though you have not seen him, you love him. Think of that. None of us has ever in bodily form stood before the risen Christ and beheld him with our eyes. And yet we love him. That is a sign that we are in Christ, that we have the spirit that he is at work in us. That's where we begin. So the first question is, do I belong to Christ, it's the most important question you can ask. And the way is that the, the way that you belong to him is through faith, by faith in Jesus. Now, if that's true, if you belong to him, Paul wants to now underscore what you have in Christ. Better put, who you have in Christ. And so the second question that we want to ask is this: it really has to do with confidence. Are you confident? Or maybe to say it a different way, way, where is your confidence? 
Paul turns to this source of confidence, and you can hear it in verse 10 and 11. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Here's what Paul is saying. Three things. If you have Christ, you have the spirit. We've already said that. It's why Jesus could say to his disciples as he was getting ready to die and then ascend, you know, rise from the dead and then ascend, it's why he could say to them in John chapter 14, it's better for me to go away so that the helper will come to you. Now imagine that. Jesus is saying it's better for me not to be standing next to you. Now why would that be? Because of the promise of the Holy Spirit. If I go away, I'll send the helper, the Holy Spirit, and he'll come and he'll dwell in you. If you have Christ, if you are in Christ, you have the Spirit. The second thing is that even though the body is passing away, I have life. Because of sin, my body is broken. My body will die. That is coming. That's what's true of me. But because of the Spirit, I have life. Now, why do I have life? He says it. He says it here, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, what righteousness? The righteousness of Jesus that was credited to your account. The perfect life that Jesus lived has now been imputed to you. And because of that, the spirit has declared you righteous, you're forgiven, and you have life both now and for eternity. You're beginning to experience new life, real life. The world wants real life. And the gospel is saying you can have it in the spirit. You can have it now, beginning to experience it, and you can have it for eternity in Christ. And the last thing that that means is that the all-powerful spirit dwells within you. Now think about the spirit. The Holy Spirit throughout the scriptures is often marked by power. He's there at creation, bringing God's plans of creation into being. He's hovering there over the waters in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. He's there at the Exodus, overseeing the deliverance of Israel. We're told in other places, Samson picks up the the jawbone of a donkey and kills a thousand men. How is he able to do that? The Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him. He's the Spirit of power. And Paul says here, he's the Spirit of resurrection. Now, all three members of the Trinity are sort of credited for the resurrection, but here the Spirit is mentioned, that the Spirit... Uh, was there. He was present. He was at work at the resurrection of Jesus, and he glorified the humanity of Jesus in such a way that he has a glorified, risen body now, the prototype of what we will have as Christians. And that same Spirit dwells in you. Here's what Paul is trying to do. Before he ever gets to the imperatives, we heard that last week, those things where he's telling us what to do, he starts with the indicatives those things which are true about you. He starts with the gospel truth because he wants you to understand who you are in Christ and what you have. Rankin Wilborn has illustrated this in a wonderful way. He said, imagine there's a scenario where you grew up with awful parents. Now, maybe you don't have to imagine that. I hope not. But maybe you've read the Harry Potter books and you think back to his aunt and uncle, the Dursleys, and he grew up in that house and they were the most awful people to him. They were mean-spirited. They were critical of him and they, they, they would lock him up at times. They made him stay and live underneath the, the staircase in the closet. And, and Rankin Wilborn is saying it's as if those type people are your parents. Those are the parents you grew up with. They're mean-spirited. They're critical. You, you get the sense that they're never happy with you. And in fact, you're not happy with them because of how awful they are towards you. They're just not good people. And he says, and then one day you stumble up into the attic and you find a dusty trunk and you quietly pick the lock of that trunk and you discover in the trunk papers that prove in fact that you were abducted by, that you were abducted as a baby. These aren't your parents after all. Why? They're criminals. And what you discover is that your real mom was a painter at the Sorbonne in Paris and your real dad was a Nobel Prize winning scientist and a baseball player. And you say to yourself, of course, this explains everything. I am extraordinary. I knew it all along. And you also read that they are fabulously wealthy 
and have a lavish inheritance awaiting you. Wilborn goes on, such a discovery would cause you to reinterpret everything in, in your life, where you came from, your true identity, your capacities and capabilities, the resources available to you, your future, and your destiny. After that day, your life would never be the same. Now that's a great imaginary story to make a point that is actually true of you and me if we're in Christ. That Paul's point being that we're in Christ and him trying to get across the point of asking you, do you understand what that means? Do you understand what it means to be in Christ? You're forgiven. There's no condemnation over you. You have an eternal inheritance. The perfect righteousness of Jesus is now yours. And by the way, you have the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is now dwelling inside of you. The same one who raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. So the question is, where is your confidence? What are you placing your confidence in? Paul's saying the very Spirit of God dwells in you, and here is a place for confidence. Now, what kind of confidence? Just kind of walking around, strutting around because we have the Spirit of God in us? No, confidence in specific ways. The first is this that we see in the text, that there's a confidence in your future. We need not fear death or what's coming. We need not fear disease because there's a guarantee of an eternal future. We have the Spirit, and so our eternal future is guaranteed. We also have the guarantee of real life. We can have confidence that while the world is out there looking for real life, we have found it. And that life is brought about by the Spirit. As we lean into Him, we will experience more of the real life we're designed for. We can also have confidence in His renovation plan. When you become a Christian, you're basically signing up for a home renovation of yourself. It's as if you invited people in, a whole crew, to come into your house and completely renovate it. Only, you don't author the blueprint. You don't have a say in exactly what changes are made. No, the Spirit comes into your life and He begins this total transformation, this complete renovation project, and He is at work conforming you to His design. And that design is the image of Jesus. And He is going to bring it about in your life as you lean into it, you can resist it, but the Spirit is there to transform you. And that's what He wants to do. He is the Holy Spirit. He wants to bring about holiness, the image of Christ in your life. Now, you might look at your sin and you might just say, well, I'm just a sinner. Well, I look at my sins and that's just the way I am, or I don't have the power to overcome those besetting sins that that regularly plague me, you know, my anger and my irritability, my dissatisfaction and discontentment with life, my, my jealousy, my covetousness, my desire to just keep on buying things to make me happy. Maybe it's my sexual sin or lust. Maybe it's my thought life. Maybe it's the things I say. Maybe it's gossip and slander. Maybe it's mean-spiritedness to the other people around me. Maybe it's selfishness. There's so many sins that we all struggle with and we might look at them and just think we have no ability to overcome them. But Paul wants us to have confidence. Where is your confidence? It's in the Holy Spirit who can change you. You have the very Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwelling inside of you and you can overcome sin. So there's confidence. There's great reason for confidence if we have the Spirit. But the question for us is, do we really want Him to be at work in our life? Do we really want Him to change us, to put to death those sins, to give us new life? That's the question. And so the last question I want us to ask and answer is this. Do you want life? Do you really want lasting life? Paul continues with the flesh versus the spirit discussion. He says there's two ways to live, as he's already said. Verse 12, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I want us to think about four things under this final question, and then we're done. Death, life, method, and motivation. The first is this, death. Paul is saying this, that if you live this life according to your natural human nature, you will die. Your natural human nature is sin. Sin 
leads to death. The lie of Satan and of sin itself is that sin will make you happy. And it's true, for a short time, it will be pleasurable. When Adam and Eve took the bite of that fruit, presumably it tasted good, but it doesn't last. It's ultimately a poison. And the more we wander down the path of sin, the more we make that the diet of our life, feeding off of, off of sin, the more we experience brokenness and death. Feeding on sin is like feeding on fast food. You see the advertisement and it seems like a great idea. I'm going to love it. And then I go and I get that greasy double cheeseburger, if it's really even a burger, and I get that supersized fry and the milkshake and I devour it. And then I'm starting to wonder not long after, was that really a good idea? I'm, I don't think I'm loving it. And if you know, if you make that part of your diet ongoing on your daily diet, day in and day out, it leads nowhere good. It really leads to death. We've seen the documentaries. That if that's your diet, a fast food diet, day in and day out, it will lead to death. And Paul's point is if sin is your diet, it will lead to death. Now that's true if you're not a Christian. It's also true if you are a Christian. That if you continue down the path of besetting sins, not trying to resist them, not seeking the Lord for change, you experience a kind of brokenness, a kind of temporal death, death to relationships and to emotions and to friendships and all of it. There's a brokenness that sin brings. And if we continue to pursue it, we will continue to experience that and make a lifelong habit of that, going down, never turning back to God, never appealing to Him for change, then you might prove in the end that you never had the Spirit of Christ, that you were never in Christ in the first place, even if you confessed Christ. Because if you wander down that path, it shows that there's no life. Now, of course, we all struggle. We all struggle with sin. The point is not if you struggle with sin as a Christian, you're not one. That is not what Paul is saying. But he's saying if there's, if there's no desire to turn, if there's no looking to Christ for salvation, and there's just this repeated pattern of death, of, of pursuing sin, it leads to death. But there's a different way. There's life. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, let's get this right. It's not the act of me putting my sin to death that saves me. That does not save me. It's not why I get life. It is evidence of the Spirit's life at work in me. If I'm pursuing putting sin to death, it's evidence that the Spirit is at work within me. And so followers of Jesus at least have a desire to, to kill sin, to look at their sin and see it in its ugliness and to say, even as, as I follow with weakness and imperfection, I'm, I'm looking at that sin and saying, I don't want that. I don't want that life. I want to turn away from it and I want to put to death these works of the flesh. I love the way the KJV puts it, to mortify the flesh, the mortification of sin. John Owen said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. We want to live in such a way that we're putting to death sin. As we see these things come out of our heart, we don't just want to ignore it. We want to put it to death. Now, the way that we do that matters tremendously. So that, here's the method. We've talked about the death that sin brings. We've talked about the life that the Spirit brings. And evidence of the life at work within you is the desire to, to turn away from that sin. But here's the method. It's really easy to miss. Just three words. By the Spirit. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. Methodology matters. You can, you can fight sin out of a sense of guilt or shame or or maybe even an anxiety. Well, I better do this because if I don't, then, then I'm not a Christian, right? You're worried about your assurance in Christ. Maybe I'm not a Christian. And so out of that guilt and shame, you, you try to fight sin. You try to be better. Now, that's one way to do it, and that is a bad method. But there's another method, and it's by the Spirit, Paul says. It's like this. You do it out of the Spirit when you do it out of your identity, 
You operate out of your identity in Christ. The Spirit wants you to remember who you are in Jesus. To be in Christ is to want what He wants. He wants me to live like a son or daughter of the King, and He's made me one. So to to follow Jesus, to have faith in Him, means that I want to conform to Him. And so I operate out of that identity, that new identity that He's given me. Rankin Wilborn says it this way, you not, no longer work for approval, you work from approval. Do you get that difference? I'm not working for the approval of God. In Christ, I have it. I'm forgiven. And now knowing that I've been approved, I work from that. I work out of that, pursuing by the Spirit the putting to death of sin. And you do it by the Spirit's power. Imagine for a a moment a a small boy calls his dad to help him come move a large piece of furniture. Maybe his toy fell back behind the dresser. And he calls his dad up to move the furniture. And as his dad goes to start to move it, the the, the little boy says, Oh, no, Dad, I've got this. I'll, I'll move it. And he tries to move this weighty furniture. And of course, he can't do it. It weighs three times as much as he, he does. And he's struggling against it. That would be foolishness when he could appeal to his dad who is standing right there to move it for him. Now, the boy had to call his dad to come move it. He had to be willing, and maybe even his dad let him help. But that's a picture of coming to the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, the all-powerful, almighty God, why would you ever try to fight sin on your own? If you knew who is dwelling in you, you would turn to him. As you saw your sin, you would look to him and say, you change me, you transform me. And he allows you to participate in the turning away and the looking to Jesus, but he's doing the work and you're looking to him. You don't just sit back and not participate. You actively participate, but you know that if you're going to change, it's not your work that's going to do it. It's your appealing to the spirit who will then transform you. Now, what's the motivation? Why would you begin to do this. Look back at verse 12, and then we're done. So then, brothers, we are debtors. Paul says, we're not debtors to the flesh. You used to be uh, a slave, in fact, to sin. That was your master, and you're no longer in debt to to, to that master, but you are now debtors. Who are we debtors to? We're debtors to God. Imagine a scenario where you have racked up a massive amount of debt. Maybe you bought a house that was far outside of your means and you have a mortgage bill that you can hardly afford, but on top of that you have student loans and then you've racked up massive amounts of credit card debt and you just have enormous debt and you've missed the payments so much that even the interest payments are so far outside of your ability to pay. And you're just sitting underneath this enormous mountain of debt. But along comes this wealthy benefactor and he pays for all of it. He pays for your house. He pays for the student loans. He pays for the credit card debt. He takes away the interest payments so that you're you're debt free. You would, of course, not be able to pay him back. And he didn't do it because he thought you could pay him back. Of course, you could never pay him back. But every time you were around him, you would feel a sort of indebtedness. Every time you were in his presence, you would feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude, of love for him and a trust in him because this wealthy benefactor took away this enormous mountain of debt. And it's like that. And that is, in fact, our true story on an even greater scale, that we had racked up an enormous amount of debt, one that we could never pay. And Jesus came and he said, I will pay your debt and I will do so at great cost to myself. And here's what you don't wanna miss. The reason that you as a Christian can put to death the deeds of the body is that Jesus was put to death for your sin. Jesus died for your sin so that you can now put it to death in an ongoing way. He has paid the price of that sin. He has declared you righteous. And now you get to work out this process called sanctification of conforming yourself to the image of Jesus. And as we begin to see that, we begin to see why Paul's point makes sense here. No wonder what Paul says is true, that true Christians will want to take part in putting sin to death in their lives. Because you can't look at the Savior 
who paid the ultimate price for your sin and say, I love you, and simultaneously look at your sin and say the same. You can't love Jesus and love your sin. Those two don't go together because you look at Jesus and you see what sin cost. You see what God has to say about your sin. Sinclair Ferguson said it this way, If you want to know how God feels about your sin, don't go to Mount Sinai. Go to Mount Calvary. At Mount Sinai, he gave the law which condemns your sin. But at Mount Calvary, he put your sin to death in the form of his own son. See, God treats sin seriously. And we know the ramifications of our own sin. We've seen its consequences. And so when we see it, would we not want to look to the Savior who has paid for it and say, I hate my sin, but I love my Savior who has delivered me from it. So that if we love the Lord Jesus, we will want to put it to death. We will want to conform to the Holy Spirit's plan to change us and to transform us. We will lean into it and we will know with confidence that we have the Spirit of Christ at work within us. Of course we can overcome sin because He can. We can turn to Him and ask Him to change us and transform us, and He will, only if we belong to Christ. So turn, put your trust in Jesus, love Him with all of your heart and with all of your affection, and as you do, He will bring life into your, your, your life, new life, real life, by the power of His Spirit. Let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, we do praise You for Your gracious love and mercy. You have showered us with what we do not deserve. We thank you for the righteous life that only you could live, that you gave it to us freely, and that you took from us our sin. We pray that we would belong to you, that our faith would be firmly rooted in you, and that as we recognize that, we would see we have a new identity. We're forgiven. We're washed clean. We're made new. And that because of that, we have the Spirit. We pray that we would have confidence in the Spirit, confidence that He's going to take us to glory, confidence that He wants to change us even now, and confidence that we can change. I pray that we would be about the work of seeking that change, that as we see the ugliness of our own hearts, we would turn to Him and ask Him to transform us, to do what we cannot do, to bring real fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, life, joy, peace, patience, and self-control and all of it, that that would begin to be worked out of our lives in such a way that, that others, that, that we ourselves as Christians would look at each other and see, ah, there's the Spirit of God at work in his or her life. We will look back and we will give you all the glory as you do that. And we pray all of this in Jesus' great name. Amen. I my cross have taken all to leave and follow thee destitute despised forsaken thou from hence my all shall be perish every fond ambition all I've sought or hoped or known Yet how rich is my condition God and heaven are still my own Let the world despise and leave they have left my Savior too. Human hearts and looks deceive me. Thou art not like them untrue. Oh, while thou dost smile upon me, God of wisdom, love, and mind. and all is bright. Man may trouble
but drive me to thy breast life with trials hard may press me heaven will bring me sweeter joy unmixed with thee. Golden earthly fame and treasure come disaster scorn and pain in thy service pain is gain I have called thee Abba Father I have stayed my heart on thee storms may howl and clouds may gather all must work for good to Rise or sin and fear and care Joy to find in every station Something still to do or bear Think what spirit dwells within me Think what Father smiles are thy spirit dwells within thee. Go with that thought today and this week, and now go with these words as your benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.